Hi, my name is Stephanie Pache, and I'm the editor and publisher of Red Carpet Reports, RCR News Media. And I'm also doing interview, interviews with filmmakers from New Mexico for the Santa Fe Film Festival that's happening from February 17th to the 21st this year. And today I get to talk to the wonderful, fabulous Lucas Matthew Stein, who is a local filmmaker here in Albuquerque, I believe, right? Yes, Correct. Ma awesome. And he's going to tell us a little bit about his background as, and tell us how he got started doing this wonderful thing that we call movies. I've been doing this all my life, as they may say in New Mexico. <laughs> I was, I'm actually from Manhattan. I grew up a child actor. By the age of six, I was doing auditions on Broadway. I was on the TV show Romper Room quite often. And, <laughs> Um, I had a wonderful upbringing with uh, my best friend's family it was a very famous Broadway family and Mr. Brennan was the lead of me and my girl 42nd Street singing in the rain Phantom of the Opera so I grew up with everybody on Broadway wow. I spent a lot of time there. Um, I did theater all my life. Uh, when I was 17 years old I was in a horrible car accident kind of ended my acting career and changed my life and began my adult life. I moved out to New Mexico. Uh, with a friend to recover and decided to stay. Ended up graduating high school in Moriarty, New Mexico. Since then, New Mexico has been the base of my life. Um, I did travel back to South Florida to where my parents retired and volunteered on a film festival there after uh, doing some community theater projects with friends. Um, and I became an assistant director and a production coordinator over four years. After that, I ended up coming out to Santa Fe because I helped start the original Santa Fe Film Festival with David Coe, John Felix, and John Bowman. I was one of the original paid members. I was head of logistics and transportation for the Santa Fe Film Festival back in the day when it was all international uh, feature films. That launched my career here in New Mexico. That got me onto the film The Missing as the film runner. They gave me a vehicle. And I was driving actors in the film around and ended up in trouble with the Teamsters. <laughs> at the end of that, I ended up with my Teamster card and back pay. I also, at the end of The Missing, ended up mm -hmm. in IOTSI, as IOTSI here in New Mexico was just getting going, and I had made, made many local friends. Right. So at the end of the film The Missing, I was in two unions. <laughs> um, I stuck with the assistant directing and production coordinating, and I would fly back to Miami a lot and come back just for the Santa Fe Film Festival. Eventually I became a driver and I drove for 15 years. 15 years later, I found myself stuck in a truck, if you would. And at that point in time, uh, I had become the driver for the executives to Netflix and the guest directors of the television show Longmire. And I helped prep and produce the first 43 episodes from my van with the entire, all the staff that the directors, the producers, the location managers, the art directors, the production designers. Um, we did everything from casting to location scouting to coordinating each episode from my van on the road. And during that time, we were going all these beautiful places. I was like, why am I not taking pictures? <laughs> Got a camera. And I picked the brains of all the Longmire directors and DPs, and they taught me how to use a digital camera. Four years later, I fell so in love with it and was so tired of being stuck in a truck, even though I had probably one of the greatest jobs you could get on a film set in this country. Right. I quit and I moved back to Florida to go take care of my father and brother. My dad got old and my brother was in a car accident. It was just time for me to go home and make some changes in my life. I said, I will not drive trucks anymore. And once I got to Florida, I pursued being a photographer. I opened a kid's acting school, opened my own photography studio and met one of the best lifestyle photographers in the world, who I then spent the last four years traveling around Mexico and uh, various destinations shooting large resort ads. So uh -huh. now if you fly into Mexico, if you fly into Puerto Vallarta or Cancun or take a boat there or many of the major harbors, you will see that the walls are lined with 90% of our work. Wow. And from that, you know, I traveled on and did more documentaries and independent stuff in Bali and Haiti and picked up local clients wherever I could go. A few years later, my heart missed New Mexico. I moved back. I started working as a set painter to stay out of a truck and stay creative. <laughs> and during this time, I've combined my production skills on set with local independent filmmakers who have ideas. 
I have gear and, and the skills to gather and amass people. I love people and people love being involved in creative projects. And this is such a fabulous community for that, that on Seven Arrows, we had 50 volunteers working to make that. On Half Track to Hell, we had everybody was volunteering and donating, you know, to do different things. And we pull things together and just get to make shows that otherwise wouldn't be made because there's no budgets when we come together as a team. And uh, it has been one enjoyable ride. That's interesting that you bring up um, your background. One, because you've been around uh, different parts of the world, which gives you a different perspective uh, on humanity. Um, but it also helps with what you see and how you translate that to someone like me, who's you know coming to Puerto Vallarta for a vacation, right? I could get all excited because I see these beautiful photos. But the two concept films that you have in the festival are totally different. And one's more of a period piece and one's more, you know, um, uh, I wanna say like a true grit story, um, if you will, uh, that faces youth. And I, I, I have to say that they're, you even shot them so they don't even feel like they're the same person shooting them. So that tells me that it's, you really have a way to make that original point of view show through rather than being the same guy, you know, re using the same kind of skills and same kind of camera angles and everything. You don't do that. My education is as a facilitator. I went to school for hypnosis, body, mind, therapy, uh, massage. Uh, I facilitate people. It is not for me to help create them in the way they wish, but to pull aspects of them out so they can flourish. It's the same thing as a filmmaker. Someone's coming to me and saying, this is me. This is my passion. This is my love. Right. Um, I want to make it like mm -hmm. they see it, like they want it. And it's my job to facilitate the digital creation of them. Right. It's interesting because for films that I, and my son went to film school and he talks about, you know, certain filmmakers, you know, directors have a, they, you can always tell it's their film because they're, you know, certain things that they do in it that kind of make it like their lighting or how they address their actors or whatever. But the, what I loved about both of the, the features or the, the projects that are in the festival are they are so different that you don't know they're from the same director, Thank which, which may, is, is a, a very, I, I want to say it's a very important skill because as, as you're taking somebody's concept or what they want to convey, you've actually translated that from their mind's eye rather than your mind's eye of what you would make for everything. At least that's my interpretation of what I think. That seen. makes me feel great. Hearing that come mm -hmm. from you is exactly my goal. And yeah, I kind of have a unique style of my own. If you send me to do something on my own, you'll see similarities in the ways I do things, as you probably did going through my, my website. But again, it's my job is to satisfy the client and to meet the mm -hmm. client's needs and not to, yeah, sure, you'll always have me and my personality when I'm involved and my energy. Sure. But my goal and my job is to make you happy and to get you what you want and the way you want it. And that just takes good communication. The first, first assistant director I ever worked for stressed with me that Lucas, no matter what job you do in the entertainment industry, we are always in the communication business. That being said, as long as we communicate, we're clear about our concepts and our ideas and everything is well prepped and planned and it has to be when you're working with shoestring budgets. Right. Oh, we absolutely. don't have time to do it again. We, we can't afford to make mistakes in our planning. Otherwise, we're not going to have a show when we sit down to edit it. Right. And um, so we're very well planned. We're very well talked through, probably more so than a lot of independent projects, just because if we put the time into that preparation, when it comes to make the show, we're going to be so ready and prepared. We're going to get what we want. We're not going to miss anything. And we're just yeah. going to have a much more fulfilling day. Right, and, and that does show through. So let's talk a little bit about Half Track to Hell um, because this, first of all, it's tough to do a period piece on a micro budget or even no budget. So for, I'm like, you have an old Jeep in here and I'm just, 
amazed, I felt that I was transported back in time. I didn't feel like it was a, you know, done on, you know, a, a shoestring budget, if you will. I really felt that there was, you know, I, I just was amazed. I didn't think that a concept type of piece that this is going to be, you know, the, the next step is a feature from this story, right? Yes. Is that correct? Yeah, that was, that was amazing. I mean, it wasn't just in a driveway somewhere where you're talking, I mean, you had a whole set built. That yeah. was amazing. So talk about that. We were fortunate enough to have the same set and the same tanks and gear that, let's say, the Manhattan Project used. These are the exact oh. same sets, okay. the exact same tanks. And the reason we're able to have them is because the lead actor and the, per the executive producer who came to me to, to make their film owns all of them. He <laughs> He builds and refurbishes the old tanks. He is the largest, uh, other than David Wang's army trucks in LA. Mm. Dennis Blanford is, and his business partner, who is uh, an attorney here for the state of New Mexico, are the largest tank owners of uh, functional tanks in the country. And wow. they own all the stuff that goes with it and they rent it out to movie companies. And Dennis is a friend of mine, an actor, Boots Sutherland's. Uh, we all hang out together and work together and do stuff. And we've been talking about this for years. We actually sent Dennis to acting classes, <laughs> uh, local acting coaches here a year and a half before we got to do this. Uh -huh. At the time when we went to do it, we still didn't have a script. The storyline is different than Basically, I shot a prequel, almost okay. leading, lead, the story leading up to Half Track to Hell. Right. So you get a sense of what's going to happen and where it's going to be. And yeah, we shot it all right here in Albuquerque with the help of El Pinto Restaurant. It's mostly shot in their parking lot. <laughs> oh, and funny. then we had the sand dunes out on the west side of town where we mm -hmm. could drive the tanks around to help us create that uh, African environment. Right. And we were just careful what we got in the background and the way we dressed our sets to right. make it look like we were in Africa in World War II. That is so, so first of all, how fun was it to be in a tank? Did you get to ride oh, in one? <laughs> yeah, I've gotten to be in his tanks quite a bit. It's a blast. As an ex-truck driver, I like driving them. They're fun. I, I bet. Wilson Hayes, who is also in that uh, Half Track to Hell, him and his father were the suppliers of all the tanks for uh, wind talkers. So okay, they, yeah. they brought all the tanks out to, uh, out to Hawaii so they could film that and they can drive all the tanks too. And that's why we had Wilson be the driver of the tank because he was the flamethrower tank okay. in wind talkers. And those are just my friends, you know, right. 15 years as a teamster we can get that kind of equipment and <laughs> operations and we, we have the access to do that. And again, it's another thing I get to bring to the productions is that I can do just about everything on a movie set and operate every piece of equipment and we have access to it. So it helps our right. budgets. We did that for probably way less than $3,000 and just to rent those tanks for a week would have been five grand. So right. we're blessed that we're surrounded by friends that are in this industry working together. And that's that's so important, especially in New Mexico, because you there's a strong um, you know IATSE and union um, group that supports filmmaking, and there's you know also background. So whenever you look at you know above the line or these type of concept films or these types of productions, it's much harder one because there's not a lot of people. It's not like you're in LA or somewhere else. You have to have networked and you have to have friendships and you have to, you know, reach out to have that community that you can, you know, turn to whenever, hey, I have an idea or I need help with something. So I, that's what I love about what I'm learning um, about New Mexican filmmakers is that there is that camaraderie and there, hey, let's just do it. There, you know, no questions asked where I won't say the market that I came from, it's like, yeah, let's do that in 10 years from now. Yeah, let's work together. And, you know, 20 years from now, and it doesn't happen. We so definitely to, rely on each other here as a community and yeah. it takes that follow through. It's, you can't, there's not enough people here to say something and not follow through. Eventually everybody will know. So around <laughs> New Mexico, if you say you're going to do something, you better do it. Otherwise people are going to, 
no. catch on and you're not going to do anything and we need each other we're a small community it takes all of us like you said the background and the same IATSE and and teamsters and crew over and over again to make all the films we're doing and we mm -hmm. all know each other like right. it or like each other or not we do well, we i think you guys like each other <laughs> but we all see each other again right. and again and again and it's family and we spend more times with each other sometimes than our own bloodline right right especially on long shoot days so what is what is something that you learned about making this um half track to hell that was the last time i will ever go in without a script We've had concept after concept. And in the end, we were like, we're going to figure this out on the day. We have a general guideline. But I, I will make sure I know exactly every shot I'm going to get before I go to the shoot after. And it was fun and we made it work and it came out great. But no, I definitely feel like, oh, I could have just told the story a little bit better if I had saw how that was going to come out mm. or what else I needed. Right, so. right. No, that's, that's a good... That's, <laughs> uh-oh, they agreed with you or disagreed? I'm not sure, I-, I... The wind <laughs> might have blown too hard in the front of the house, so. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, we're gonna, we're getting some weather here, uh, supposed to get some snow uh, later, so we're battening down the hatches later, right? Well, I've um, got my Instacart shopping already because they're even shutting down for the year. So you have this film and you also have G uh, Seven Arrows Juvie Cowboys which I have a passion for in my heart. Once upon a time, I was the woods boss, AKA coordinator for what was called the Southwest Youth Corps. And so I ran a program that trained over 172 at-risk youth, kids who were either suspended or expelled from school um, and, or wanted to be national parks rangers and were forced into an AmeriCorps program. In between one of my coordinating seasons in the Santa Fe Film Festival, I stumbled into that. I spent my whole life at summer camps. And so, uh, and as a wilderness expert, when they came across me, they needed someone to run that program. And I spent six months, nine months doing that. And I had a blast. So when I saw the Joy Wang interview with Keith Copson on the news regarding his vision quest tale of mm -hmm. taking these at risk youth on a journey from Arizona to Canada, I was like, Keith, I want to make your story. So I actually pursued Keith to let me make his story. Um, nice. That was the second show I had done. The first one I did is with a woman named Dodie Montgomery who teaches acting at UNM. We haven't released that yet. Okay. Uh, but so I was warmed up then and I, I hunted Keith down and said, I love your concept. This is what the world needs. The, the world needs a show to show teenage boys how to be men. Right. There's all the stuff, there's women's movements galore and there's everybody wants a man to act like this and a man to act like that. And when I was younger, I was wild and I needed to learn somewhere and there was really nowhere to learn. And we think Seven Arrows is a community project that can help at-risk youth, especially the boys. And there's just not enough for that. No, I, I totally agree. I'm, I love, love talking to Keith and felt his passion and also love the, the, uh, the, the project that's in, entered into the festival as well. So we you have- meant to make a film out of that. We <clears throat> meant to make a trailer and promotional materials. Right. And then we just had enough stuff. We were like, oh, let's put it together and see what it looks like. Right. No, and you know what? It's also a great piece to make the next step, right? Because a lot of, short stories, short films get picked up because they're great ideas. Maybe there was no you know, money to make it into a feature at the time, but they have, you know, studios have taken shorts and made them features. We you know? did all that for less than $3,000, money out of our own pocket. We have raised a few dollars from people who want to see the next phase, but we want the next right. phase to be done correctly. Right, right, understood, yeah, great. So you have one more thing uh, in the hopper that's coming out um, and you can't talk about that yet because I know I, I look in your eyes like, hi, I wish I could tell you, but I can't. I do, we have one that's finished. We're right. gonna wait on that for a bit. It's a very suspenseful reality sci-fi woman story. It's okay. uh, kind of a really cool 
really cool chick flick, if you will. Very, very mind bending. Um, I'm also on the verge of producing a three song Bollywood musical that I'll be working with a lot of local talent doing. We're trying to let COVID pass a little bit. I have the same people who wrote the songs for Seven Arrows are writing my Bollywood Oh, music nice. specific for Albuquerque. It's going to be a very big Al Albuquerque piece all about a boy moving to New Mexico and his adventures within three songs, a very okay. Ferris Bueller's Day Off kind of tale of moving to Albuquerque. Nice. We'll shoot that in the spring. Um, and I'm just getting noticed that my photography team, who we used to do all the ads for in Mexico, uh, were I'm crewing up right now. We just got a big resort chain and our first shoot with them, this new group will be in nice. Nevada. So okay. I've got a lot of projects in the iron. I'm always doing something. I just got off Roswell as a set, set painter. I've been painting sets okay. for Randy Ortega for the last three years while I'm here. So that's kept me busy through the pandemic. It's right. been amazing. Right. And uh, there's never a moment of downtime when I'm not doing that. I'm shooting headshots in my studio and personal projects with uh, my teammate for collaboration imagery, Tino Duvik. And we're always doing something. My film sets, when I'm working as I ask, that's my day job. The rest of the time, <laughs> we're making stuff. That is amazing. And it's so it's so nice to speak to you about, you know, you're you're kind of a renaissance man. You're not just you don't just do one thing, you do a lot and you have such a, um, a way of expressing that through film um, that's you. unique. And it's, and like I say, it's for me, the two pieces that I've seen is unique by different projects. So I'm not feeling like it's the same person directing. And that, that takes, you know, that's, that's huge. I mean, for, especially, I won't say what the director, but one director that I love his stuff, but I hate his lighting it makes me crazy. And so every time I'm watching something, my son's going to remind me that's by so-and-so. So no complaining, please. And but, six years ago, I was a truck driver. I, and you, <laughs> you know what? The, the path that your, your career, if you want to call it a career, your, the path of your artistry is amazing. I mean, you did start, you have to remember, you did start out on Romper Room and entertaining people and you still have that in your blood. So um you know that's carried you through those romper room years were very important very formative for sure absolutely i've never actually forgotten them <laughs> i i can't say that i will admit i did watch romper room um and i don't remember why but yeah dancing around with a bumblebee and doing <laughs> all sorts of kid stuff and, and then i met other actors that were actually you know uh tony collette i've done a few movies with her quite closely i was her driver and on the hours i, I hung out with her quite a bit and all sorts That's of stuff and right. she was on romper room but she was one of the main people too so it was neat to see how many people from there actually did stuff i'm like right. i'm just gonna be going sure sure no it's it's great i i wish we had more time to spend with you but we will because i have a feeling you and I are going to be talking a lot over the years um, and maybe work together. Who knows? Because I think you're fabulous. Thank you. very. So, much. And thank you for um, supporting Santa Fe Film Festival with your projects. Of course. Um, we're excited to see what happens from February 17th to the 21st. You can watch them online. Um, again, thank you uh, to Lucas, Matthew, and my brain is gone, Stein. And, and of course, too many names, too many names. You ran your, your name all into one. So that made it harder for me to, to read, even with my glasses. But um, you, uh, thank you so much. Um, we appreciate talking to you and we will see you again. Thank you.